Good morning, everyone. And uh, what I will try to do now is uh, to um, provide a scientifically convincing story of the links between the local small-scale farmer depending on rainfall on the African savanna with climate resilience and the scientific, latest scientific update that we are at risk of destabilizing the whole Earth system and how these hang together and that we now need a whole new paradigm of planetary stewardship to ensure local human well-being, be it in Berlin or in Niger. Now, we know that over the last, let's see if we, over the last 1.2 million years, which is the geological period in the Pleistocene, we have only two states of the planet. You see it in the furthest back here, the deep blue uh, hole here, which is deep ice age, minus four degrees Celsius average temperature on Earth. And then you see the little cup there, which is what we call interglacials. Short warm periods, we've had six to eight of those, where temperatures go up to maximum plus two degrees Celsius warming on Earth. Over the last 12,000 years, we've been in such an interglacial. It's called the Holocene. It is what I would call the Garden of Eden for humanity. It is actually when we left the last ice age, and the first thing we did was the most important invention of all inventions, we domesticated animals and plants. We became farmers. We developed sedentary communities, which was the takeoff point for innovation and evolution towards the modern world as we know it. That's the Holocene in the beginning. Then time goes on, and we have over the last 8,000 years followed a journey of persistent unsustainability, which has made the planet slide out of this safe little cup into a very slippery zone where we today do not know where we're heading, and that we, for the first time, scientifically can say that we are approaching a point where we are at risk of irreversibly sliding into self-reinforcing pathway that can take us for the first time to a third state of the planet, which we've called the hothouse Earth, the high Zeit planet, a place that we have seen in the past for roughly five million years ago, when the planet was in a completely different state. That's the drama, that's the drumbeat of where we are, that we in this generation, living on Earth right now, are at risk of pushing the planet across thresholds that could irreversibly take us to a point where we have very little likelihood of being able to deliver human well-being to any one of us as humanity on Earth. Now, this is supported very strongly by the two most important scientific reports in all time, I would argue. The first one is the IPBS, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystems, that launched its second global assessment on ecosystems and biodiversity just a few months back this spring. And of course, the IPCC 1.5 degrees Celsius report of end of 2018, showing that the Paris Agreement, which is the legally binding climate agreement to stay well below two and aiming for 1.5, was not a choice of some kind of socioeconomic arbitrary numbers. Oh no, 1.5 is a biophysically hardwired number in the Earth system. Go beyond 1.5 and we risk losing very many of the life support system that we depend on for food and livelihoods. The IPBS report, I'm sure you've read in media, shows that we are in the sixth mass extinction of species. We are actually at risk of losing one million of the eight million known species on Earth. We've actually lost, since 1970, 60% of the vertebrate species on Earth. We are on a sliding path that in itself would undermine ecological functions in ecosystems. Now, just a few weeks back, you had the IPCC land report, which is fundamental for everything that we've been describing just here on, on food and security for the future. The first report that really shows that climate change, land management, and human well-being are so tightly interconnected. And uh, just a, a very important reminder that we are today at 1.1 degrees Celsius warming, which is shown in this black curve here, but on land, on terrestrial ecosystem where we live, the temperatures are actually already at 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. So it's just thanks to the slightly lower temperature in the polar regions and in the oceans that we have 1.1 degrees Celsius. The little unpedagogic graph to the right there is just the data showing that land management and thereby food systems today are the source of 23% of greenhouse gas emissions. So not only do we depend on food, 
food is also the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions because of the unsustainable production systems we have today. So not only do we have a challenge of, so to say, meeting the challenges of bridging malnutrition, rising populations from 7.6 to 10 billion people in the next 30 years, we also need a transformation from an unsustainable to a sustainable food system in the future, just as a way of reaching the Paris Agreement. The risk patterns are very serious. This is the famous red embers diagram in the land report, showing in dark red, high risk, yellow, low risk. And here you have exactly the points that were just uh, presented earlier here on water scarcity, soil erosion, risks of, of failure for small scale farmers, eating itself down in risk, as you see below two degrees Celsius warming. So already at 1.5 degrees Celsius warming, we can say with quite high degree of scientific certainty, that we will have even larger need for, for insurances for small-scale and large-scale farmers. What is it that has taken us to this point? And here are the three key insights and evidence pieces, I would argue, are the foundation behind the journey we've seen so far. The first one is that science can now say, in, in, in sort of say academic, formalized way, that we've welcomed humanity to a new geological epoch. We're leaving the Holocene, where we've been over the last 12,000 years, and we're entering the Anthropocene. Anthros for us humans, meaning that we are now the dominant force of change on planet Earth. We surpass the effects of orbital forcing due to our distance to the sun. We surpass volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. We are the drivers of the state of the entire Earth system, meaning weather, water, oxygen, temperature. Now, the data for this is not some kind of theory or models. It is the hockey stick patterns of observations since the Industrial Revolution. So this graph is the famous 2007 Great Acceleration graphs from 1750 up until today. The purpose is not for you to read the, the graphs. You just, just look at the pattern. You can see that they basically all of these parameters, and on the green side, you have deforestation, CO2 emissions, overuse of nitrogen, overuse of phosphorus, deforestation, acidification, loss of biodiversity, any parameter that matters for our human well-being, they have the same pattern. They follow a pattern which goes as follows. If you put them on the same graph, on the x-axis here, from 1750 until today. And I'll just click them forward, and you see the hockey stick patterns, that there's a, a kind of a similarity here, that up until a certain point, which happens to be roughly exactly 1955, we have a very limited impact on the Earth system as a whole. In fact, we still we have problems, but we are still following a quite linear, incremental journey of negative impacts. Then in 1950, we put in the big full gear of exponential rise in pressures. We're three billion people on Earth. We're 10 years after the Second World War. We put in the high gear of the industrial metabolism. Things go to scale in a way that we've never seen before. And off we go into this exponential rise. And science has then now concluded we enter the Anthropocene in the 1950s. Now, that is a very important insight. But I would argue there's an even deeper insight, which is the one that we really need to understand, which is that we entered the Anthropocene in the 1950s. Off we go in the exponential rise of unsustainable pressures. We continued deforesting overfishing, emitting greenhouse gases, eroding soil, expanding agriculture, chemical pollution, microplastics. But how does the Earth system respond? Well, it doesn't send any invoices back. It's quite interesting how it absorbs and buffers. It has so much resilience. There's so much atmosphere out there. There's so much fish in the oceans. There's so much rainforest. There's so much ice. There's so much capacity in the system. So we move into the 1970s, even into the 1980s. The first warnings come, by the way, in the 1980s with the ozone hole, you remember, with the Montreal Protocol and the threat of actually making the Earth system uninhabitable because of us causing the CFC, the Freon-caused ozone hole. But for the rest, it's quite stable. But we have now more and more evidence, it's still on hypothesis, that roughly 1990, is the point where we hit the ceiling, where the resilience of the Earth system has come to the end of the road, that we filled up all the space. We have lost 
too much rainforest, too much biodiversity. We've passed 350 ppm in C, uh, greenhouse gas CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. We see acceleration of ice melt in the Arctic. We see collapse of the Baltic. We see collapse of cod fisheries in Newfoundland. We start seeing the drought frequencies increasing. There are, for the first time, the scientific publications of worrying signs. And it seems as if it's the last 25 years we are in this saturation point. And 25 years after this, we come to 2015 and we sign the Paris Agreement, we sign the Sustainable Development Goals. It's like we need one generation to really get, um, as we say in Swedish, poletterna trillaner, how do you say that in English? To get the, the understanding to sink in properly. And this is what may have happened now, that we are seeing the turning point because we've been in a saturation point for such a long time. There's an Anthropocene working group which has been working on the evidence behind this, showing that the Holocene is really what I would call a Garden of Eden, and how we're now moving in a very dangerous direction, potentially pushing the whole Earth system away from this stable state. So that is insight one. Welcome to the Anthropocene, and not only that, we're quite deep into the Anthropocene. Insight number two is that the Holocene is our desired state of the planet. We have so much evidence of this. I'll just show you one graph. This is ice data from Greenland. It's, very, it's basically the same data you saw in the previous graph, showing the last 20,000 years, average temperature on Earth. Zero is the average 14 and a half degrees Celsius temperature in the pre-industrial estimates from 19 they're from 1850, but it's a temperature variation from 1950. So it's basically before we start the fossil fuel burning journey. You see how we leave the last ice age, we enter the Holocene period, and how we've started to raise temperature just over the last 150 years. This is the evidence that gives us uh, a reference point of the dire desired state of the planet. So insight number two is, we depend on the Holocene for our ability to support the modern world as we know it. This is, this is the drama, and we have so much evidence to support this that have come out just recently. This is a paper that came out just last year. Uh, this is a very messy graph. Personally, I, I love it because it's the first time anyone has attempted to put 60 million years on one graph. So the, <laughs> so the x-axis here is 60 million years. It's a bit logarithmic, that's why it's a bit messy. On the y-axis, you have average temperature on Earth. What you should check out here is just the yellow part here is, is the Garden of Eden, the 12,000 years of extraordinary stability. Look at that. It's like a plus minus one degree Celsius journey. When any climate skeptic comes to you and say, sure, temperature's rising now, but we've had so much variation in the past. We've had you know, the little ice age, the medieval warm period. We in the Nordic always hear that Vikings grew grapes on Greenland in, in the 1200s. Well, that's true, within plus minus one. Within plus minus one, we've had a lot of variation. Now then you have the Milankovic cycles back one million years, the up and down, and then you have the Earth system further back in time. To the furthest right, you have the IPCC trajectories. You see 2100 up there, which is roughly at four degrees Celsius warming, which is the black line there. That's business as usual. That's where we're moving towards, four degrees Celsius warming by the end of this century. But look at this. If we draw that line back in history, how, how long time back would we wind the climate clock because of our business as usual? Well, it's not like one million years we would wind back the clock roughly 10 million years, meaning that if we continue business as usual, in a blink of time, in 150 years, we will have raised temperatures on Earth to a point, as far as we know today, where we haven't been for the past 10 million years. This is just to show you what, what enormous experiment we are performing, performing at the planetary scale. So that's insight two. We need the Holocene as our reference point. Final insight is that while well, we're punching the planet, putting a lot of pressure on the whole Earth system, how does she respond? Well, I said that up until 1990, there were no invoices sent back. It was a linear trend of absorption and what we call um, negative feedback, so basically dampening the pressures. We have so much evidence that up to a certain point this is correct, but then we can cross thresholds and have non-linear changes, what we call tipping points, and that these are fundamentally universal 
from everything from wetlands to lake systems to forests to savannas to rain systems to ice sheets. And here's just a video summarizing the state of knowledge on these tipping elements that have nonlinear changes. And you'll recognize them. You have the permafrost that is one of these dark horses that can tip very fast. The Arctic winter ice is moving abruptly already as we speak. You have the El Nino system, so the regional weather systems are also believed to have these nonlinear trends. The rainforest, of course, which is burning right now, the African savanna system. Then you have the jet stream coming up here, which is regulating the northern hemisphere high and low pressure systems. A whole set of systems that we now understand are interconnected and regulate the state of the planet, which have this nonlinear behavior. A nonlinear behavior that we're understanding as science advances. This is um, a way of illustrating this, which, which I think really uh, hits home the message. As you know, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has come out every fifth year with, with its assessments. It is the most authoritative assessment of our knowledge on climate change. If there's any critique against the IPCC, it is that it tends to underestimate risks. Why? Well, it's because it's over 3,000 scientists trying to come with a minimum common denominator. But look at the trend line here. What you see here is the summary from 2001 to 2019, four assessments on the best assessment of the risk of so-called large-scale discontinuities. To put it in, in simple language, disaster, okay? The, the, the big things we don't want to happen, that we irreversibly trigger a loss of the Greenland ice sheet, that we irreversibly have collapse of coral reefs, that we irreversibly knock over the Amazon rainforest. Risk of big, big systems irreversibly changing. In 2001, the best assessment we had was that this could happen in red at roughly four or five degrees Celsius warming, the, the 10 million year point. I mean, really low risk. Then came in 2007, the AR4, and the risk had gone down to, you know, four degrees roughly. And then came the AR5 in 2013, and the risk was down to something like two, three degrees. And then we have the 1.5 report, which brings it down to two degrees. So the more we learn about how the planet works, the more reason there is for concern with triggering large-scale changes. We passed on the following graph to Patricia Spinoza and the United Nations Framework Convention, which summarizes this as well. This has gone to the climate negotiators. You, you, you recognize now the Garden of Eden graph, leaving the last ice age, entering this extraordinarily stable phase of the last 12,000 years. Average temperature again on the y-axis. This is the Paris Agreement. This is staying below 2 and aiming for 1.5. A uh, slight reminder that even if we succeed with Paris, it's outside of the stable Garden of Eden state. This is where we're heading. We're moving towards the four degrees, as I mentioned earlier. But here we have the tipping point risks from the latest science. And what you see here is the uncertainty range in science. There will always be uncertainty. But what's worrying is look at all these systems here that what I call dip into Paris, which means that according to the latest scientific knowledge, we are at risk of triggering nonlinear changes, tipping points, already at two degrees Celsius warming for the West Antarctic ice shelf. In fact, it's not published yet, but in the scientific community, there is more and more signals that we have already crossed the tipping point on the West Antarctic ice shelf. This means three meter sea level rise already committed. It will take perhaps 400 years or 500 years for it to melt, but it would be irreversible. But look then for Greenland, the same. The Arctic summer sea ice, alpine glaciers, they all have a risk at two degrees Celsius. And look at coral reefs. The entire uncertainty range is within Paris. This might mean, or I would even say has a high likelihood of meaning, that we already have the first planetary victim. Meaning that even if we succeed with Paris, we're very unlikely to evermore have tropical coral reefs on Earth uh, for future generations, because they are, according to our knowledge today, very likely to cross tipping points even below two. So that's the situation we're in. You put all these insights together, we're on the Anthropocene, Holocene is our reference point, tipping points are real. That takes us to the need of a planetary boundary framework. We need to know what are the scientific targets within which we can have 
a manageable planet, to avoid triggering these tipping points, because the window is still open to avoid it. The IPCC is clear. If we can cut emissions by half over the next decade, we can actually return back towards 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. We can come back to this green, safe operating space where we stay within the planetary boundaries. And the important with the planetary boundaries is that they are identifying the systems that regulates the state of the Earth system to stay as close as possible to the Holocene. And it's not only climate. It is, as you see, land, water, nitrogen, phosphorus, biodiversity, the systems that we depend on for the food systems. So this has been advanced as science from 2009, and you have the update in 2015. Today, establishing quite firmly that if we can manage the nine systems from climate, oceans, and stratospheric ozone, but also the biosphere systems that food systems are so closely related to, biodiversity, water, nitrogen, phosphorus, and our land systems, we stand a good chance, actually, of being able to have a future where we can avoid the irreversible changes I just summarized. There's a humble recognition that this science really is well-founded. This is a paper that came out, led from the Potsdam Institute actually just a few months back, showing that over the last three million years, temperatures on Earth have never exceeded two degrees, which is a humble reminder that the Earth system is a self-regulating living entity, if we put it that way. You have orbital forcing from the sun, but the biosphere, nature, responds and dampens and cools and keeps the system quite intact. We have translated the science on the journey for humanity forward into what we call the carbon law. The carbon law is inspired by Moore's law, which was, became, as you know, a self, kind of, uh, self-regulating prophecia of a doubling of the speed of computers every 18 to 24 months, which became a self-fulfilling prophecia in the innovation in the computer industry. We think that the carbon law, which means cutting emissions by half every decade, if we do cut emissions by half every decade, at any scale, but ultimately at the global scale, of course, we can actually succeed in avoiding these most negative trends. This can tr be translated into one graph, actually. In gray here, you see the carbon law of the trajectory we need to follow, bending the curve in the next year, actually, but that's from the IPCC work. We can come back to how late we can wait with that bending point. And then we have to have a fossil fuel-free world economy by 2050. We reach there by cutting emissions by half every decade. But also, as a reminder in this discussion today, look at the little brown sliver there, which is the food system today, the single largest sector emitting greenhouse gases. How it's expected to go from source to sink in orange, meaning a, a green revolution in the world's food system, from emitting greenhouse gases in brown to becoming a sink of carbon in orange. The exciting thing is that, as, as you know in this room, we have the technologies for this. We know how to produce food, making s farming systems more resilient by adding more organic matter, working with conservation tillage systems, water harvesting systems, together with science and technology for seed and for fertilizers to make farming systems more resilient and more climate smart. Then we have the green and blue here, which is to maintain the carbon sinks and natural ecosystems. The message is very simple. We can no longer expand agriculture at the expense of natural ecosystems to feed humanity. Now we need a green revolution where we produce more food on existing land. So that is the, the sustainability challenge for humanity. Decarbonize according to carbon law, transform the world's food system, keep it ecosystems intact, and we can take us back to a safe operating space. Two, three days back, we also published a paper led by Jeff Sachs. This is a graph before that, but it is actually in Nature Sustainability, showing the six transformation areas that can take us to the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. One of them is, as you see, the food, biosphere, and water transition, that applying existing knowledge on food can take us where we want on the journey towards delivering on Paris and the SDGs. So this is a, a major, major evidence around the importance of, of this transition. Together with Christiana Figueres, uh, we presented the 30 solutions to cut emissions by half by 2030 to the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco last year. In two weeks' time, we're doing an update on this for the Climate Summit that Antonio Guterres is organizing in New York. We showed, I would argue very convincingly, 
the sector by sector by sector, we can cut emissions by half over the next decade. It's not utopia. It's actually doable. In agriculture, in food consumption, in transport, in energy, the obvious one, it is possible through wedges of investments in areas where we have solutions. We also know that we need to define or redefine sustainability. I think it's time to now understand that we're talking about prosperity, about thriving, about equity within a stable Earth system or within planetary boundaries. We need to link the people, planet, and truly do it and start thinking at every scale. If we work on a village scale, still recognize that we are interconnected to the planetary scale. Unfortunately, we are not following that journey very well. This is a paper looking at the planetary boundary state for all countries in the world. I think it's, unfortunately, I'm coming to my end here. I just need, need you to have this with you all the time that we're, we're kind of on the, on, still on the wrong path. And this just shows all the countries in the world in circles here. On the x-axis, you have the number of planetary boundaries that we are transgressing. So the further you are to the right, the worse it's going. The, the more we're destroying water, biodiversity, nitrogen, phosphorus, and climate. On the y-axis, you have all the sustainability or social indicators that we value so much. Here we have economic growth, human development index, life expectancy, everything that we uh, measure as success. So the further higher up you are, the better we are performing. And of course, there you have them, the rich countries in the world. There you have the Germanys and the Swedens and the US in the world. It's just a reminder that by 2018, when this came out, we're still delivering success at the expense of the planet. Unfortunately, we, we haven't yet come up with the magic of how we can transition towards a success path together with the planet. There's no country up in this desired corner. This is where we want to be. We want to be successful together with the planet. So that is our big task, and the food system is central here. We came up with the Eat Lancet report just uh, half a year back for the first time trying to scientifically define healthy diets from sustainable food systems. We did this with the planetary boundary framework. We actually looked at the question, can we feed 10 billion people with healthy diets from sustainable food systems? This quite messy graph here is the sustainability modeling work done for that. I just want to... Uh, the key message here is that business as usual is on the top line there, showing that if we continue as today, we'll be transgressing, red meaning transgressing, all the boundaries on greenhouse gas emissions, cropland, water, nitrogen, phosphorus. But if we have a transition in the furthest low here, where we use technology and science, where we do transition into what we call a planetary healthy diet, which is a diet that follows the latest science on health, which is reducing animal protein. It's not a vegetarian diet, but reducing and balancing, having a more diverse diet in terms of different legumes and vegetables and fruit and nuts. You can actually come back into a safe operating space. It can be done, but it requires health, reducing waste, and technology. So the sustainable development goals really matter. The challenge, though, is that they have to be kept together as one framework. They cannot be, as the tendency is today, to be adopted as, you could call it like a Swedish smurgos board. You know, you, you pick your goodies and your little favorite goal here and there. Oh no, if you want to work on food, you have to work on food while recognizing that goal six on freshwater, goal 13 on climate, goal 14 on oceans, and goal 15 on land really are fundamentally integrated with your endeavors. So much that I would say that this whole story transforms the sustainable development goals into what I would call the, the wedding cake, which is that there are four sustainable development goals that are non-negotiable. Non 6, 13, 14, 15 are the planetary boundaries. Water, oceans, climate, and biodiversity. But within that, we can have thrivability. We can have prosperity. We can have very ambitious goals for humanity to succeed within a safe operating space of a stable Earth system. Science is rising to this. Business is rising to this. We have the Earth Targets Initiative by the Global Environment Facility, the World Economic Forum, setting science-based targets, not only for climate anymore, but beyond climate also for the Earth system, setting targets for uh, planetary boundaries. 
The scientific community is working on looking at transformation pathways, innovation pathways to meet the SDGs within planetary boundaries. So really trying to, to respond to this challenge today and to do that in a way that integrates science, innovation and equity. So my final slide and perhaps the take home point is why not put the sustainable development goals inside that planetary boundary framework? as one way of guiding the vision forward and thereby the investments over the next decade, which has to be the transformation decade where we bend all the curves and take us to a direction where sustainability is no longer the sacrifice, but the path to success and equity. And therefore, I think this kind of gatherings are, are so important. So thank you very much for your patience.